Well, good morning. It's Bruce Williams, and it's time for part two of my series on the selected gross pathology of the rabbit, in which we're going to talk about the respiratory system. Before I start my lecture, however, I would like to begin as I always do by thanking my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me their images very unselfishly, both directly and through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. So let's talk about the respiratory system where some of the key diseases in these species arise. Anyone that has worked with rabbits at all is familiar with one of the most common and one of the most serious diseases of this species, that of pasteurilosis caused by Pasteurella multocida, also known to lay pet owners, breeders, and laboratory colony workers as snuffles. Chronic rhinitis, as seen here with a bit of mucoid discharge around the nose, is the most common manifestation of this disease, with up to 70% of animals affected in some colonies. Animals are often infected, usually around the age of three months, and direct contact is the most important method of spread for this disease. The pathogenic bacteria um, demonstrate adherence to pharyngeal cells, and serotype 12A is the most common uh, <clears throat> serotype of this bacteria that we see in colony outbreaks. You should always confirm this disease with bacterial culture, but deep nasal culture, just going in through the nose, is a very unreliable method. We'll talk ab about other places to look very shortly. Pasteurella can manifest in a, a wide range of exhibited behavior. Here's an animal in a position we're going to see with, with snuffles and a number of other diseases in following lectures. And this is torticollis. A lot of people think that this is a middle ear infection, but actually it indicates the infection of the inner ear. And this is only seen in about 5% of cases of snuffles, while otitis media is seen in a third or more cases. Another manifestation of pastoral multosta may be seen on, in meat and fur farms and is known as the sleepy bunny syndrome. This bunny looks a little tired. Okay, this suggests septicemia rather than abscess formation or rhinitis and is likely due to the effect of endotoxin. Remember, Pasteurella is a, a gram-negative bacteria, so if we can successfully destroy the bacteria, we still have to deal with the exotoxin, which is a primary component of its cell walls. And the, the sleepiness is probably the effects of endotoxin on the central nervous system of septicemic animals. You may see no gross lesions at necropsy in these animals, but because of the endotoxin, Look for hemorrhages on the organs, fibrin thrombi, and cellular degeneration and necrosis in the liver and adrenal gland. Very classic signs of sepsis, which we'll see with pastoral multocida in a number of animal species, including avian species. Okay, so the major, major lesion that most people are familiar with is a catarrhal to ultimately a mucopurulent rhinitis. Um, Environmental conditions often are, are major contributors to infection. So if the animals are cold or there's a high ammonia because they're not being, uh, the cages are not being cleaned out on a frequent basis or, or poor sanitation or they're overcrowded, this will all contribute to the spread and the severity of cases of snuffle in an outbreak. The animals will often have epiphora due to the rhinitis and the plugging of the nasal lacrimal duct. <clears throat> you can occasionally culture the organism from the conjunctiva as well. Pasteurella multocida is a bad actor in rabbits and as we look at the uh, the various laboratory species, each of these species has some bacteria that really cause significant problems and they all act in a very similar way as as we've seen. In mice and rats, we talked about Mycoplasma pulmonis causing pneumonia, causing uh, <clears throat> otitis media, and reproductive infections. 
In rabbits, it's pastoral multocida. In guinea pigs, it's going to be Bordetella bronchoseptica. And they all act fairly the same way. So I like to sort of lump them together and just remember which bacteria goes with which species. This is a classic presentation for pastoral multocida in the rabbit. <clears throat> you can see the large plates of fibrin covering the pleura, the consolidation of the lungs that don't collapse. This is a diffuse fibrinosuppurative bronchopneumonia and pleuropneumonia. Areas of infection are often well demarcated if there are areas of the lung that are not quite affected. The disease can also be very chronic and, and manifest in a subclinical fashion where it's very difficult to pick up because this is occasionally a septicemia. You want to look for fibrin deposition in potential spaces like the pericardium um, or the abdomen. Lung lesions can be extremely variable. You can see a diffuse fibrinosuppurative bronchopneumonia. This is a large pulmonary abscess, which is ruptured. The lung has actually become just a big bag of pus. It's not as common in the lung as it is in the skin and the draining lymph nodes. The pus is, is often very tenacious, and when it gets into the lymph nodes, it can be very difficult to drain. Here's a great example of pastorella in a uh, large abscess lymph node. You can see there's probably been some leakage. There is a lot of adhesions. And abscesses can appear in any organ, whether it's the liver, whether it's the brain. You can see that in association with pastorella. The jaw is a place where you see a lot of them. Um, because the agent is chronically in the, it's often present in the upper respiratory tract. Sometimes it acts a bit like strangles in horses. This would be called bastard strangles here, but it will get deep into the, uh, the, the mandibular lymph nodes and cause these very tenacious uh, abscesses. can also get into the jaws. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. And they can be just absolutely the devil to try and treat. Bordetella does like to hang out in areas with cilia, and you will commonly see it as part of uh, uh, an infection of the middle ear. Very difficult to show the middle ear. There's only a couple of ways. This is one. Another way is to, uh, to sort of uh, take off the jaw. So whenever I see something like this, which shows me uh, the, the foramen magnum, I'm always looking at the, uh, at the middle ears and and this person has done a pretty good job of cracking open those tympanic bulla and you can see the exudate it's a little mucoid on one side it's mucopurulent on the other and uh, so this would be a case of otitis media and i said um that deep nasal culture is usually not a good way to get this bacteria this is one of the best if you are doing posts on animals and there's a strong suspicion of pastoral multosta, you have to crack the tympanic bulla and culture in there. Because as we said, over a third of the animals will have infections with pastoral multosta. Histologically, here you're going to see squamous metaplasia. You'll see lots of inflammation and accumulated pus. And these may ascend into the middle ear and even get into the brain from from the inner ear. They also, these, these abscesses within the brain might also come from rhinitis or conjunctivitis as well, but the inner ear is probably the most likely route of infection for cerebral abscesses in the temporal area of the brain. We're looking at the uh, reproductive tract of a doe. And pastoral multocida can arrive there as part of a septicemic infection, or it may be transmitted venereally from the buck. Um, it does take a while to, uh, uh, to manifest. The, they will develop a transmural and necrotizing uh, pyometra, and they, the does will often die within a few hours of showing the disease. 
the bucks that are infected may get a suppurative orchitis. Pestromaltocida is well known as one of the causative agents of atrophic rhinitis in pigs, and it actually will do the same thing in a number of other species, including the rabbit. Okay, serotype 12A is well known for causing this lesion. Here's a normal cross section through the turbinates of a rabbit on the left, and then you can see an animal with atrophic rhinitis due to chronic rhinitis and pasturella infection on the right. You can see something very similar in dogs, sometimes in guinea pigs with pastorella multocida. So just remember, atrophic rhinitis and pastorella tend to go hand in hand. Here's another section. Three rabbits, clinically normal. A moderate case of atrophic rhinitis. And here there's almost no turbinates at all. Once again, due to uh, a pastoral multosa. Histologically, in and around the turbinates, you want to look for increased numbers of osteoclasts with active bone resorption in animals, especially those with clinical snuffles. Now, there aren't a lot of things that look like snuffles, but there is one other condition that we'll talk about now. We'll talk about it in a couple of other lectures um, that can mimic snuffles. Um, and this is uh, Staphylococcus aureus infection. Especially in the adult animals, you can get signs that look almost identical to uh, snuffles with these large areas of abscessation within the lungs. And this is why culture, at least cytology, is so important. So you don't make the, uh, make the wrong mistake and, and think, okay, I've just got another snuffles outbreak, when you're actually dealing with Staph aureus. In young animals, or animals that are being ra uh, raised for fur and meat, uh, Staphylococcus may present as a septicemia, and you get these large, not large, but these numerous abscesses within multiple organs. Um, it looks like your typical septicemia, your gram-negative sepsis that we see in so many species, but in the rabbit, it has to do with being Staph aureus. Staph aureus is uh, you know, ubiquitous in nature, and as well, the uh, the GI tract of rabbits and, and rodents tend to have a much higher incidence of gram positives than gram negatives, which is why administration of so many different type of antibiotics um, can be devastating in the rabbit. So these are young animals, they usually have a staph septicemia. It's a very important cause of neonatal mortality. For anybody who has found young rabbits in their, uh, in their yard and tried to raise them, the mortality is always very high, even if you take great care of them. And staph septicemia is one of the more common causes of neonatal mortality in these young, wild, uh, hand-reared rabbits. And just another, another picture from Dr. Dean Percy um, from his book showing the abscesses in the kidney and even abscesses within the myocardium. This is probably a young animal, probably a, a nursing kit. Okay, I'm going to put this in. This is a, a disease, Bordetella. It does not cause too many problems in rabbits. You do have the occasional mortality with Bordetella. It's a gram-negative. It can act a bit like snuffles. Um, but usually, mortality is, is when it's combined with pasturella. The big problem is that rabbits carry bordetella um, very happily, like many animal species, and they can transmit it to other laboratory animals, especially guinea pigs, who are incredibly susceptible to it. So it can be a problem. You know, one thing I've, I've learned is that uh, you're going to have the occasional mortalities in just about any species, including non-human primates, including dogs, with, uh, with really pathogenic Bordetella cases. They're rare, but you do see them. So never sleep on Bordetella. The old belief that, well, Bordetella causes kennel cough in dogs is pretty well outdated. So if you're working around animals for in pathology for any length of time, you're going to see mortality as a result of Bordetella. 
don't have a lot of viral diseases affecting uh, the lungs of rabbits and this is one that is not primary but it really has good lesions in the lung and this is rabbit hemorrhagic disease or rabbit khaleesi virus we're going to talk at length about this when we get into the liver but uh, in addition to causing uh, severe necrosis and high mortality in these animals uh, rabbit khaleesi virus also is a uh, it will hit endothelium in a number of organs including the lung you will see thrombosis and edema and because it does such devastation in the liver as well um, these animals do not often have the uh, uh, the coagulation factors required to stop the hemorrhage in these damaged vessels that's why they call it rabbit hemorrhagic disease these animals primarily manifest with with DIC and you can usually see hemorrhages throughout the lung or at least edema Okay, a couple of more respiratory diseases, not all that common. Um, some large multifocal granulomas uh, within the lung of a rabbit. And rabbits are excellent uh, experimental models for pulmonary tuberculosis. I would suspect that this one might have been uh, aerosolized with the condition to get such focal, uh, well-defined lesions. Uh, mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis which causes paratuberculosis in scotland we call it yoni's disease um is the the wild rabbits erectilax cuniculi the european rabbits are considered to be a uh, a reservoir species for that their um, mycobacterium avium is a, a species specific opportunistic pathogen probably a transplacental um, infections and you may see uh, organisms in the lung of animals at the time of weaning with with no associated pathology the disease is most often seen um, mycobacterium avium in young rabbits and it may be pulmonary it may also be enteric uh, enteric as we see in so many other species with mycobacterium avium and it's very common in wild pygmy rabbits. Nice case of interstitial pneumonia. You can see the uh, some very faint rib impressions, but the lungs are inflated. They have not deflated. There's no evidence. This is a diffuse uh, process, so it's an interstitial pneumonia, not a bronchopneumonia. I wouldn't be thinking about snuffles in this particular case. And like so many other species, uh, rabbits have pneumocystis, which will manifest when the animals are severely immunosuppressed or may have some form of concurrent disease. And uh, because these have been broken out, uh, used to be all pneumocystis carinii, which made them easy to remember. Uh, now it's pneumocystis orictolagii in the rabbit. And this manifests when, uh, because our cell-mediated immunities take care of this parasite and keep it into this fungus and keep it in very low numbers. When the animals are immunosuppressed, um, then it will bloom and the alveoli will be filled with macrophages trying to control this uh, uh, fungal infection. And with a silver stain, you'll be able to easily demonstrate the uh, trophozoites and cysts, odd names, uh, for a fungus, but this has gone through many different reclassifications. So we've kept the trophozytes and, and the cysts which they live in, but the silver stains will uh, will demonstrate them very nicely. Pneumocystis orictolagi. Okay, one last uh, uh, one last condition, um, and this is a little bit more of a rule out. We have these large white. Uh, lesions throughout all sections of the lung. Um, I would consider, as we've already talked about, mycobacterium avium uh, in the lung of a rabbit. That would certainly be a possibility here. Second one would be lymphoma. Uh, lymphoma is uh, common in rabbits. Um, the kidney is almost always affected. Occasionally you'll see it in the lungs. But there also is a gamma herpes virus. Um, called herpes virus silvolagus, 
which affects cottontail rabbits. And after infection, they will develop a lymphoproliferative disease, which may look like this within about six to eight weeks. The final thing I would think about is, uh, is that rabbits are used as, and they classically have been used along with guinea pigs as a model for hypersensitivity uh, pneumonitis. And generally, they are injected, I'm um, giving several injections with Freund's complete adjuvant, and they will develop a, a very profound uh, pneumonitis with uh, a uh, thickening of the alveolar walls by large numbers of macrophages and lymphocytes, and occasionally eosinophils within the alveolar walls, and they'll spill out into the alveolar spaces. So a classic animal model for study of uh, uh, allergic lung disease. Okay, that brings us through the respiratory system. We may touch on Pasteurella once or twice more as we go through the rest of the lectures. It certainly is an important disease, and it's a good one to lead off this series of lectures with. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. We're going to talk about the cardiovascular system in our next lecture, and I hope you turn in for that one. I hope everybody has a fantastic day.